Okay. Don't worry, we didn't cover much. But just, well, quickly just jump back to the start. So, you know, previously we discussed life in Abyssinia and how life became unbearable for the people in Mecca and the Prophet ﷺ and his followers were not able to protect those who were weak. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted the companions permission to migrate to Abyssinia and seek refuge there. Now much later on, during the Medini period, the Prophet ﷺ had a group of people from Habasha come to Medina. And he got them food, he got them water, he got them pillows, he got them whatever they needed. He showed them hospitality. So the Sahaba, being the students of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, told him, you don't need to trouble yourself. Ya Rasulullah, we will take care of all the hospitality. But the Prophet ﷺ, he replied to the Sahaba and said, no, 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 these people, they honored my companions and they showed hospitality to them. It would be my honor, my privilege to get to serve them. And so the Prophet ﷺ always had that lasting gratitude to the people of Habasha. And whenever an Najashi, the king of Abyssinia, did something that was publicly challenged, he had a tradition to deal with it. So an Najashi, as we know from last week, he had accepted Islam. He uttered words of Islam. But the people, his people, started spreading rumors that there was going to be an uprising, there was going to be an attempt to overthrow the Najashi. So an Najashi tried to keep his Islam as private as possible. So an Najashi, he had a piece of paper on which he had written the Shahada. Right? And in it, he also even included the phrase that Allah placed Isa divinely into the womb of his mother. Right? So the aqidah of an Najashi was sound, was sound with Islam. And he had written down that he didn't believe in Isa's divinity on that piece of paper. So what he would do is he would keep that piece of paper like inside his shirt, right? On top, uh, on, on, on top of his pocket where his heart is. And so the people would sometimes confront and ask an najashi like, do you say that Isa is the son of God? Like, do you say this? And so an najashi would say yes, right? He would say yes, but then every time he says yes, he places his hand on the piece of paper that he had the shahada written on, that he had the true aqidah, the true belief written on. Right? So an Najashi's life one time was threatened. Right? He had a personal servant who had also accepted Islam uh, and told an Najashi that some people in his court planned to assassinate him for forsaking Christianity. So this piece of paper that he had was his own way, his trick to keep his enemies at bay while at the same time keeping his Iman intact. So this was the Najashi, the king of Abyssinia. Now the migration to Habasha occurred in the about sixth year of Nubuwa, about the sixth year of Nubuwa. And it was during this year that two great victories were brought to the Muslims. So one day, Rasulullah was in Mecca and Abu Jahl approached him. Now you have to keep in mind that when the Muslims left, this left the people of Mecca very sour and very bitter. Because now everyone is going to say that we cannot take care of our own. And that's why they left. How will we go trade with the people of Abyssinia, show our face in that land when those people are walking around openly knowing what we did to them and we can't do anything about it? How can we face the fact that the truth of our oppression is now out in the open? Because the oppression was always okay to them. It was just the fact that they didn't want people to know that they were oppressing. And so through their dhulm, through the oppression of the Quraysh and the non-Muslims in Mecca, there were two mercies from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that came. Number one, one day, Anna Abu Jahlan marra bi Rasulullahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam inda safa fa'adahu wa shatamahu wa nala minhu ba'da ma yakrahu wa Rasulullahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sakitun la yukallimuhu. So one day Abu Jahl approached the Prophet Muhammad and was very abusive to him. Was insulting him, was being nasty to him. And they were, out, they were on Mount Safa. They were on Mount Safa. And so Abu Jahl was in one of those, I gotta torture a Muslim moods. Okay? And so he started to insult the Prophet He got even more aggressive than he had ever been before. And so Abu Jahl, kept getting more vile, more disrespectful to the Prophet ﷺ. To the point that he created a huge scene 
And other people were telling Abu Jahl, other non-Muslims were telling Abu Jahl, knock it off already. And so of course Abu Jahl wouldn't listen. He continued to insult the Prophet And what did the Prophet do? He just walked away from the situation and he remained silent. And even while he was trying to walk away from the situation, Abu Jahl would follow him around and continue to insult him. And so there was a servant who was a servant of a, uh, someone by the name of Abdullah ibn Jid'an. Right? And this was a, 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 a woman servant of Abdullah ibn Ja'an who witnessed this abuse. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, He says, وَإِذَا خَاتَبَهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا سَلَامًا Right? Whenever foolish people try to, you know, improperly say things to you, right? Uh, then only respond to them with peace, right? So when people became abusive with the Prophet ﷺ, just for trying to do the right thing, he did not waste his time with them. Many Mufassirun say that this verse directly, وَإِذَا خَاتَبُهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ It was actually referring specifically to Abu Jahl and his instigating. Right? So the Prophet Muhammad Sallam, you have to remember that his mission was his mission. Right? He lived in a universe where he did what he did because he wants to please Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And so what people did may have impacted him emotionally, but it never changes his actions or reactions. It always remained principled, it always remained in line with what Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala wanted, even his words. Because what, is, what, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? وَمَا يَنْطِقُوا عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَىٰ That he never speaks out of his own desires. Anything that he says is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Abu Jahl becomes very abusive. And there was a girl who served Abdullah ibn Jada'an who witnessed this. And the Prophet said, I'm standing quietly. And that his silence was hurting Abu Jahl. So no one stepped in because Abu Jahl was the leader. They didn't want to mess with him. She left because she wanted to find someone to help. Now, before we move on to the, to the actual story, let's take a pause and let's talk about somebody by the name of Hamza Radilawan. Hamza Radilawan was coming back from a hunting trip when this servant saw Hamza Radilawan. So she went up to him. Now, Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib was the paternal uncle of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi and also at the same time was a milk brother of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? They were very close in age and they grew up like brothers. So a majority of scholars say that Hamza accepted Islam after the migration of Abyssinia took place. And there was a slave woman who was a slave woman of Abu Jahl named uh, uh, Thuwayba, right? Sorry, not Abu Jahl, Abu Lahab, right? Uh, Thuwayba. Now Thuwayba, what was one of the interesting things about Thuwayba is when the Prophet ﷺ was born, Abu Lahab was so overjoyed at the birth of his nephew, he freed Thuwayba. Thuwayba will later on nurse both Hamza and Muhammad ﷺ. Now Hamza عن, before Islam, he was a very respected individual. He was the son of Abdul Muttalib. So he had status already. He was also like the cool guy, right? He was the life of the party. He was the focal point of a room. He's like a guy's guy. He's fun to be around. So Hamza was also a well-known fighter. He was tough. He was one of the few people in Arabia who knew how to fight with both hands, right? Double wield, basically, right? He knew how to do that. So Hamza's hunting trips were also very famous. Sometimes he'd be gone for days at a time. People would like to go with him. People would be excited when he comes back. What did he get? So Hamza had gone on one of these hunting trips. And when he came back, he came all geared up with his bows, his arrows, his, uh, his skins that he'd gotten from his hunting. So he was in a good mood, right? I'm ready to go hang out with the boys. I'm in a good mood. And he also always had a spiritual nature to him. That whenever he would return from his hunts, he would go to the haram, he would put everything down, he would do tawaf around the Kaaba, express his gratitude for the hunt, and then, uh, and, and that he came back safely. So Hamza Radru'an returns from this hunt, and everyone who sees Hamza greets him. And he's all happy, right? So this woman 
the servant of Abdullah ibn Jid'an, she goes to Hamza and says, Oh, Abu Umara, and then told him what happened. Right? And Hamza was friendly in nature. So the woman felt comfortable walking up to him. And so the woman said, you know you're walking around with this big smile on your face, but something extremely disrespectful was done to your nephew. And so Hamza radiallahu said, what's going on? He says, well, your nephew, your brother, who you're supposed to be so protective of, Muhammad sallallahu was just treated terribly today. It was unbelievable what happened to him today. And so Hamza radiallahu an, naturally he asks what? Who, or who messed with him? So the woman told him, right? It was Abu Jahl, and no one stepped in. No one stepped in and told off Abu Jahl. And Hamza radiallahu was so mad at Abu Jahl that he walked into the haram. He found where Abu Jahl was sitting with his friends, gloating with his friends, talking about the scene that he caused the other day. He said, you disrespect my Muhammad, you deal with me. So Abu Jahl said, Hamza, you sound like you left the religion of the unbelievers uh, uh, as well. And so Hamza replied, I have. I believe in what Muhammad believes. I believe Muhammad is the messenger. If you want to mess with me, you come mess with me. Don't mess with Muhammad. And so then Hamza he says, so, the other people went and they came to So after saying this statement, right, Hamza radiallahu an, he walks into the Kaaba, he finds Abu Jahl, and he confronts him, and Abu Jahl, or, or Hamza radiallahu an, he raises his bow, and he smacks Abu Jahl on his face, right, to the point where he actually starts bleeding pretty heavily. And so when that happened, other people that were around Abu Jahl start to approach Hamza with their fists raised. And Hamza gets into warrior mode, right? He gets into warrior mode. And so Abu Jahl, Jazakallah khair, Allah yibarak fiqh. Okay. Fish mushka, fish mushka, wallahi. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give Abdul Qadir Jannat al Firdaus. May he give him, uh, or may, may he be quenched with the kawthar. His thirst be quenched with the kawthar on the day of judgment. Allahumma ameen. So, Abu Jahl essentially said, no, 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 back off, back off. Leave Abu Umara alone. Right? This could turn into a very ugly situation before you know it, probably, because Hamza radiallahu could have single-handedly destroyed all of them. But also, Abu Jahl himself, he admitted, فَإِنِّي وَاللَّهِ قَدَ سَبَبْتُ ibn أَخِي uh, 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 that I did say very mean and nasty things to the Prophet Muhammad I was out of line. Do you know how vile he must have been that Abu Jahl even said, I gone too far? And what's, what's, what's amazing is what did the Prophet do in response? Nothing. I'm not going to entertain this. Right? The Prophet is above this. So, Hamza basically says, look, if you guys want to rumble, time and place, let me know. And then he walked away. So the people around Abu Jahl got very frustrated at Abu Jahl because they said that Hamza was not a Muslim, but your aggression and your oppression pushed him to Islam. Right? This is, this is deep. When you're going to be oppressive, when you're going to be aggressive, towards other Muslims, all you're going to do is going to cause other people who aren't even Muslim to wonder why are they being so aggressive and oppressive to the Muslims. Let me go find out about this deen. Let me go find out about this religion. And when they learn about this religion and they're taught the truth about the world and they're taught that this is the, this is the haq, this is the truth, people want to accept Islam in mass, right? When you get your Islam from the source, not from Fox News and CNN, 
you're more willing and ready to accept Islam. So Hamza radhi'an he went home. And this is a very emotional moment for him. And he's thinking to himself, what have I done? I love Muhammad وسلم, with all my heart, but do I actually believe in his message? So he had a very long night. Shaitan whispering at him, trying to make him reconsider. Then he said that he made a dua. And this dua that he said is, Allahumma in kana rushtan fa'aj'al tasdiqahu fi qalbi wa illa fa'aj'al li mimma waqa'atu fihi makhrajan. Oh Allah, if this is true, what Muhammad says, if this is true, then put the truth of that into my heart. Let me be firm in my belief of it. And if it's not, then Allah make a way for me out of this situation. And then yeah, he said, I went to sleep. Then he went to sleep. And that whole night was full of confusion. And he tossed and turned that whole night. And he was recalling what happened the day that Hamza beat Abu Jahl over the head while making a loud public proclamation of accepting Islam. And he can't back out of it now, right? Because he can't just go up the next day and be like, oops, yes, I made you bleed, but I take it back. So he tossed and turned that whole night trying to figure out what to do. And then when he woke up, he said that I realized the path was clear. And Allah opened up the path for me, and it's time for me to take that step. And so he went to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he told them about his thoughts. Ya ibn akhi, inni waqa'tu fi amrin la a'rifu al-makhraja minhu, wa iqamatu mithli ala ma la adri. Arushdun huwa am ghayun shadeed. My dear nephew, I've put myself in a position that I don't know how to get out of. This matter of mine that I've stepped into, I don't know if it's good or bad. So he wanted to have a conversation with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He wanted him to talk to, uh, uh, he, uh, he wanted the Prophet to talk to him, to clear things up with him. فَأَقْبَلَ عَلَيْهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وسلم. So the Prophet وسلم, you know, responded to him and talked to him. فَحَدَّثَهُ بَحَدِيثِ الَّذِي يُنِيرُ الْقُلُوبِ وَيُطْمِئِنُّ النُّفُوسِ وَيُذْهِبُ ظُلُمَاتِ الشَّكِّ وَال, وال, uh, والوس, وَالْوَسَاوِسِ فَذَكَّرَهُ وَبَشَّرَهُ وَأَنْذَرَهُ فَثَبَتَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى الْإِيمَانِ فِي قَلْبِهِ فَقَالَ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْ أَشْهَدُ إِنَّكَ لَصَادِقُ فَأَظْهِرْ دِينَكَ يَا إِبْنْ أَخِي Allahu Akbar The Prophet ﷺ sat down with Hamza رضي الله عنه and he laid out the truth for Hamza رضي الله عنه and by the time the Prophet was done Iman had been put in Hamza رضي الله عنه's heart The Prophet ﷺ shared words and the heart of Hamza fell right into the hands of Rasulullah Wasallam. And so Hamza says, I fully testify to the fact that you are telling the truth. So now please lay the framework of what you're teaching. Because I swear to Allah that I will not go back to the religion that I was following. This was such a joyous occasion for the Prophet Muhammad because his uncle Hamza is not just his uncle, but he's also an extremely strong leader, an extremely strong man. He's Asadullah wa Asadur Rasulihi. He's the lion of Allah and the lion of the Messenger. No one matched his courage in the battlefield, in everyday life. And so he gave the Prophet Muhammad hope at a time where he needed it most. And this brought the Prophet a lot of peace. A lot of tranquility that anyone accepting Islam brought the Prophet a lot of happiness. But when his own family members were accepting Islam, obviously it was even more joyous occasion. So Hamza Radu'an's acceptance of Islam also reaffirmed the relationship that him and the Prophet had even way before the days of Islam and the days before prophethood. And so because Hamza always looked out for Muhammad like an older brother, he was a protector of Muhammad. So the Prophet was used to having Hamza always, always by his side. He was used to having Hamza standing and protecting his back. So it was shocking enough to the Prophet ﷺ that five, six years had gone by without Hamza accepting Islam and standing side by side with the Prophet ﷺ in Iman. And one beautiful thing about this, about this story as well is this teaches us the power of our actions. It wasn't the preaching of the Prophet Muhammad that made Hamza accept Islam. It was his sabr. It was his patience. 
So we should always exhibit excellent character in our life. One action of our life can trigger something else that will cause somebody to accept Islam. Right? Our job is to do what is right as Muslims. We may not know what may be the ingredient that causes someone's iman to rise. But it's our duty to be the best manifestation of the sunnah, of the way of the Prophet Muhammad that you can be. And the world is going to be full of trolls. It's going to be full of haters. Leave them. Just do our job of representing correctly the message of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now the second mercy that happened, the second victory that happened during the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallam was Umar Radiallahu An. Right? What can you say about Umar Radiallahu An? We could be here for years if we talked about the great qualities of Umar Radiallahu An. Umar ibn Khattab, he was the Umar ibn Khattab's mother was the sister of Abu Jahl. So Abu Jahl is the maternal uncle of Umar ibn Khattab. So Umar, actually for a lot of his life, had been mentored by who? Abu Jahl, right? And Abu Jahl being a diplomatic leader of Mecca, of Quraysh, he would manage the relations between all the tribes and families. He was like the secretary of state of Mecca. So Umar's pre-Islamic position in the community was to help delegate those negotiation terms and contracts to other tribes. So he was the deputy to the Secretary of State, right? And so he used to be sent by Quraysh, uh, uh, by Abu Jahl, to negotiate terms with other people. So from the get-go, Umar ibn Khattab already had leadership qualities within him. He was a very confident person. He was a very decisive person. He was also very tall and strong, so he was imposing, a little bit intimidating, right? Now at the time, at the time, as we've discussed about what, you know, the age of ignorance before Islam came and rectified a lot of the evils that were going on in society, there was a lot of prostitution. There was a lot of gambling. There was a lot of fighting. There was a lot of drinking that was rampant, right? SubhanAllah, you know, I always uh, uh, laugh at the idea of progressivism when this, these are the qualities that we find in many societies today. And the Prophet ﷺ came to, to uh, you know, uplift societies out of these qualities, right? And so that is what true progression was. And so going back to that is not progression, it is regression, right? So subhanAllah. But anyways, Umar was the representative of Quraysh. But pre-Islam, he was also a little bit of a loose cannon, okay? He would take part in some of those activities. So... For Abu Jahl and other leaders of, of Quraysh, they didn't like this because they didn't want it to be a representative of Quraysh. And without his iman, there was nothing to contain Omar's social gifts properly. So he was a bit of a troublemaker. So the leaders of Quraysh were not sure whether Omar al-Duran was reliable, but Omar al-Duran was so gifted and talented at what he did that when it came time to negotiate terms for another tribe, He'd sober up, he'd go in, he'd take care of business, problem solved, and then I'll be partying until you need me again. Right? This is like Dennis Rodman, basically, right? This guy. If you get that pre-Islam, all right? Post-Islam, obviously, Omar ibn Khattab uh, is one of the greatest men to ever walk this earth. And so Omar ibn Khattab had close brushes with Islam consistently even before his occasion on which he accepted Islam. And he had built up a lot of pride and ego because of the status that he had, right? He had a bit of a rowdy lifestyle. And one time, Umar al-Duran was out all night, and he was drinking. And he later walked into a temple that was for worshiping idols. And he laid down and passed out. Now normally, most people would get upset. You can't just get drunk and then pass out at a temple. But this was Umar radiallahu So he was like, I'm not... Uh, uh, nobody's going to touch him. People aren't going to stay, right? People are not going to say. Uh, people aren't, aren't going to say get lost to Omar al-Duran. So they pretended as if he's not there, just passed out at the corner of the temple. Now the ritual of this temple was people would bring in an animal and sacrifice it to the idol that was in the temple. So then the worshippers would take out the insides of the animal and lay it on the feet of the idol, and they would soak the idol with the animal's blood as part of the ritual. Right? Again, it's just all jahiliyyah. So Umar al was lying down and he woke up 
after the people walked into the temple, and even before Islam, the worship of idols never really, never really sat well with Omar. With Omar oh, wow, that was a weird American accent switch right there all of a sudden. Omar, right? It just, it just seemed unintelligent to him, right? This idea of idol worship. There's actually a story later on when Omar ibn Khattab is, is the Khalifa, and he starts to chuckle a little bit. And so some of the people around him ask, why are you laughing? He says, I remember a time we used to build idols out of dates, and then, and then what would happen? We would get hungry, and then we would eat the, eat the idol, right? So like, he always had this kind of feeling, this is kind of absurd. But you know what, everybody else is doing it, so I'm not going to try to question it too much. So when those worshippers dragged in the goat, the goat was kicking and screaming. And Omar al was thinking, here go these weird superstitious people. And this is a perfectly good goat, and you're going to waste it on this idol. So they're watching this scenario, and the worshippers are about to slaughter, they slaughter the animal. They take out the insides of the animal, and then all of a sudden, a voice comes from inside the dead animal. Dead animal. And Omar al acknowledged that he was hungover and a little out of it, but even the people who slaughtered the goat heard the voice and jumped back. And the voice said, this whole ritual business, it's time for the nonsense to stop. The time of Muhammad has arrived. It's time to go back to the worship of one Allah. Right? So basically a dead animal was saying this, one of the miracles. So the worshippers all just left the animal half cut open and ran out of the temple. And Omar radiallahu an kept lying there in his drunkenness. Right? And then in time he forgot about the incident. And then Omar ibn Khattab's second close encounter with Islam was when the Muslims were migrating to Abyssinia, Omar radiallahu an was confused on what was going on. So he asked a woman, where are you going? And she said, I'm leaving Mecca. We're not safe here anymore. And Omar al was upset because it was true, right? It was true. The problem is Omar al he misdirected his disappointment. He misdirected his anger. Because Omar al right? And we see in, in the life of Omar ibn al-Khattab pre-Islam, there are small moments that you find where you see true good moral character and good intention in the heart of Omar al So Omar al the reason why he was so upset was because his community was disunited. And who wouldn't be upset at that, right? Of course he wants his community to be united. Of course he wants his community to come together. So he wanted to figure out the root of the problem. And so in his mind, his logical thinking that he broke down, he said what? Before the Prophet Muhammad there was no division, there was no persecution, there were no families breaking. So the problem is who? The Prophet Muhammad right? This is what he's thinking in his head. And so he thought of a way to squash that problem. One night, as narrated by Imam Ahmad in his Musnad, Umar al-Ru'an could not sleep because he was so frustrated and he wanted to find the Prophet Muhammad and challenge him. So he went onto, into the streets looking for Rasulullah and passed the Kaaba. And there was the Prophet right there and he was doing what he was doing most nights, which is what? He was praying his salah. And Umar al-Ru'an came close, and it was the first time Umar al-Ru'an heard the Qur'an directly. And the Prophet ﷺ would stand in a way where he not only prayed towards Baytullah, the Kaaba, but also toward Bayt al-Maqdis, Masjid al-Aqsa. Because at this time, where was the Qibla? Masjid al-Aqsa, right? And it will change to the Kaaba during the Madani period. And so, this was the Prophet ﷺ's way of offering the Salah. He would try to combine both qiblas, right, together. So Umar al he sees the Prophet Muhammad Sallam and he thinks to himself, let me just go see what the fuss is all about. What's all the hoopla about? What's he got to say? Let's hear him out. Let me just go listen to what this person has to say. Right? I mentioned this before and I'll mention it again. Many of the early enemies of Islam, they tried to kill, they tried to torture, they tried to silence, they tried to uh, imprison. But one thing they just wouldn't do is listen. And look at what happens when you listen. And it was at that moment that the Prophet Muhammad in his beautiful, sincere voice, reciting the Qur'an, and ah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the pleasure of hearing the Prophet recite the Qur'an. He starts reciting Surah Al-Haqqah. Al-Haqqah. Mal-Haqqah. Wa ma adaraka mal the hour, what is the inevitable hour, and what will, make, what will make you realize what the inevitable hour is? Talking about the Day of Judgment. 
Both Thamud and Aad denied the striking disaster. As for Thamud, they were destroyed by an overwhelming blast. And as for Aad, they were destroyed by a furious bitter wind. And this is because of their denial. And so in these verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about what? What happens to arrogant people. And he talks about Fir'aun in the surah. He talks about how he tried to act tough in front of Allah and what happened to them. And this is a Mecki surah, right? And a Mecki surah is a surah that was revealed before migration, right? Not necessarily just in Mecca, because there are, Mec there are technically, uh, um, you know, uh, Madani surahs that were revealed after Fatih Mecca in Mecca, but they were still referred to as Madani surahs. So a Mecki surah is actually not just, it was revealed in Mecca, but it's also a surah that was revealed before migration, right? And these surahs, they have a lot more rhythm and flow. So not only is the words powerful, but the flow was hitting hard. So if you look at a Mecki surah, they have that rhythm and flow. But a Madani surah, usually because it has a lot of ahkam and technicalities, it has more kind of like a, like almost like a, uh, like a narrative to it, like, like, like a story kind of to it, right? Way of, of, of recitation. And both are beautiful, right? Both are equally as beautiful. So Umar Adru'an, his heart was shaking at this. Because then Rasulullah starts talking about something that's going to happen on the Day of Judgment. That those who will be given their record in their right hand, meaning that their book of deeds will be given to their right hand, which means that their book of deeds is filled with good, right? It's filled with good. They will cry and ha happily, and they will basically go running around trying to basically show everyone, 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 read my record, right? You know when you get that graduation diploma and you're super excited, so everybody holds it up, they throw their caps in the air, right? Everybody's super, super excited. So he's super excited, this, the, the, the people that get their books in their right hand. I knew this day would come. I knew this day would come. Those people will be in a life full of bliss. In an elevated garden. Where the fruits will hang within reach. And they will be told, eat and drink joyfully for what you did in the days that had previously gone by. But then there is a second side to all this. And as for those that have been given the record in their left hand, they will cry bitterly, I wish I had not been given my record. Or know anything about my reckoning. I wish death was truly the end. My wealth has not benefit, is not going to benefit me today. It has not benefited me. My authority has been completely stripped away from me. And So it will be said, seize them and shackle them. These are the people that were arrogant. These are the people that disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are the people that worshipped their own desires over the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And burn them, burn them in the hellfire. And then tie them up with chains, 70 arms long. For they never had faith in Allah, who was the greatest. Nor encourage the feeding of the poor. So this day they will have no close friend here. Nor any food except غسلين, which is like this burning, oozing pus. Which none will eat except the evildoers. And so at this point, Umar al says, I was completely gripped. It had this powerful grip on me, but at the same time, the stubbornness was still there. And so I thought to myself, listen, man, don't get too caught up on this guy. Muhammad Sallallahu is just a really, really talented poet. And then the verse was recited. This is not the words of a poet as you claim, yet you hardly have any faith. And Umar al-Khattab is now stunned. Because he didn't say this out loud, he's thinking this in his head. And again, this is being narrated directly by Umar al-Khattab himself, not a secondary source. 
And so he's thinking to himself, this person knows what I'm thinking. He must be, he must be a fortune teller. He must be a sorcerer. And so what's the next verse? This is not the mumbling words of a fortune teller. You, but you're not, you're not being mindful. You're not thinking. And so now he's thinking, what is this? What is going on here? This is a revelation from the Lord of all worlds. That if the messenger had made up something in our name, that we would have, we, he would have been punished as well. If the Prophet ﷺ were to attribute one false statement to Allah, he would be held accountable. He would also be punished as well. فَمَا مِنْكُمْ مِنْ أَحَدٍ عَنْهُ حَاجِزِينَ Right? And obviously this is hypothetical because the Prophet ﷺ would never do that. No one can stop Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. None of you could have shielded him, right, uh, from us. وَإِنَّهُ لَتَذْكِرُتُ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ And indeed this Qur'an is a reminder to those who are mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a reminder of those who are conscious of Allah. وَإِنَّا لَنَعْلَمُ أَنَّ مِنْكُمْ مُكَذِّبِينَ And we know that some of you are still skeptical. You will still persist in denial. وَإِنَّهُ لَحَسْرَةٌ عَلَى الْكَافِرِينَ And this is very sad that you're still in denial. Because this is going to be a sad sorrow for you. This will be a source of regret for the disbelievers on the Day of Judgment. وَإِنَّهُ لَحَقُّ الْيَقِينَ And indeed this Qur'an is the absolute truth. Whether you like it or not, it's the truth. And you know it's the truth. And so this Qur'an is literally speaking directly to Umar ibn Khattab فَسَبِّحْ بِسْمِ رَبِّكَ الْعَظِيمِ So glorify the name of your Lord, the greatest. Praise the name of your Lord. And so Umar left him alone that night. And similar to Hamza Radhiwan, was very confused that night. Didn't know what to believe, didn't know what to think. I came here to try to stop the Prophet Muhammad and now I was just spoken to directly by God basically, through the Prophet Muhammad What is going on? Right? And you know, uh, you guys may have noticed when leading Salah, I like to recite the Surah a lot. Right? It's not because it's the only Surah I have memorized, it's just because I just like, I like it, right? And the reason I like it is because the last verse, فَسَبِّحْ بِسْمِ رَبِّكَ الْعَظِيمِ Right? Allah is telling us, say, سُبْحَانَ رَبِّ الْعَظِيمِ And then directly right after that, you go into ruku' and what do you say? سُبْحَانَ رَبِّ الْعَظِيمِ Right? It's beautiful. It's a beautiful connection, right? So, you know, alhamdulillah. Anyways, khair. So the next morning, he woke up very confused. And then, فَخَرَجَ رَضِلُ عَنْهُ مُتَوَشِّحًا سَيْفَهُ يُرِيدُ قَتْ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. So the confusion also caused him to get very angry. And so he said, you know what? I'm going to just get rid of the Prophet ﷺ once and for all. And so he walked out into the streets of Mecca with his sword unsheathed. And you have, Mecca is not an open carry state, right? If you walk with your sword unsheathed, that means business is about to go down. And so people saw this. And so one companion by the name of Nu'im ibn Abdullah an, he saw Umar an walking with his sword and he approached him. And along the way, he asked Umar an, what do you intend to do? And so Umar an replied, he said, I am going to look for Muhammad. I am going to find this man who has abandoned his religion. He is a heretic. He's divided the Quraysh. He made fools of some of the most intelligent people. He tainted our religion. He cursed our gods, our deities. And I'm going to kill Muhammad. I'm going to finish him off once and for all. Now, Nu'aym obviously became very worried. The strongest guy in Mecca is now coming for the Prophet Muhammad That's scary, right? I would be worried. We would be very worried because the Prophet Muhammad is what? The most beloved person to the Sahaba. Right? And so Nu'im, normally, he's not the type of person to cause trouble. But at the same time, he's dealing with Umar Adru'an, who has a certain reputation of being a little bit harsh, belligerent. And right now, Umar has his sword in his hand, and he seems hell-bent on killing the Prophet ﷺ. So Nu'im said, Wallahi, you are extremely deluded, O Umar. Do you really think Banu Abd al-Manaf, the Prophet, the family of the Prophet, will let you walk around freely after you murder the grandson of Abdul Muttalib? Now Umar Adran wasn't even phased. He didn't seem to care. So Nu'aym realized that he needed to now step up his game a little bit. He's desperate 
to save the life of the Prophet Muhammad So he said, instead of going to kill the Prophet Muhammad why don't you fix your problems at home first? Keep your family, your own family in line. You're out here to fix other people who are out of line, but your family needs to be in line first. And so Umar al Khattab was stopped in his tracks. What are you talking about? Right? What do you mean that I get my family in, in line? And so Nu'aim replies, your brother-in-law, Sa'id ibn Zayd, and his wife, who is your sister, Fatima bint Khattab, and your brother-in-law is also your cousin, have both accepted Islam. Both of them follow Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So you want to deal with someone, deal with your own family. Now, what does Umar al-Duran do? He goes to the house of his sister, where Sa'id and Fatima anhuma, were being taught the Qur'an by a companion by the name of Khabbab ibn al-Arat. You guys remember Khabbab ibn al-Arat? Right, we talked about him extensively, young man, young companion, was tortured very severely to the point that his back, like this, this, the, the hot coal, had to lay down on hot coal and his, his back was basically completely fried off. And so actually Umar al-Khattab is very funny. Umar al-Khattab later on is going to be, uh, when he sees Khabbab ibn al-Arat, he says that Khabbab ibn al-Arat, I love having Khabbab ibn al-Arat around because he reminds me of what true sacrifice is. He reminds me to keep going. He reminds me to stay motivated. So right now, at this point though, at this point though, Umar al-Khattab, he knocks on the door of Fatima, his sister's house, Fatima, and he yells, what are you doing? Did you guys just, did you guys just leave your religion? Right? So Khabbab ibn al-Arat, he heard Umar al-Dawan outside, and what does he do? He hides. He says, no way, I'm not going to confront this guy. <laughs> right? And keep in mind, this is the same guy that literally, his back was fried off on hot coal. So his toughness is already on another level. This just tells you how, you know, strong Umar ibn al-Khattab was, how, uh, how, how, how uh, powerful he was. So then Fatima responded and said, no, we didn't leave anything. We just accepted the truth. And so Umar al-Khattab, this is where he went crazy. And he hit rock bottom. He gave Saeed ibn Zayd a beat down. And then he went to his sister and slapped her. And it caused her to bleed. And then Fatima said, you want my answer? You want the answer, Umar? Yes. We have believed in Muhammad. We have rejected these idols. We have accepted Islam and the Prophet Muhammad's message. What are you going to do about it? If you want to kill us, go ahead, do your worst. And then Umar al-Khattab began to snap out of it. I should not be doing this. I said the Prophet ﷺ is the problem and now I'm the problem. And in one narration, he saw verses of the Qur'an written. And so he went to grab the piece of parchment that had verses of the Qur'an written. And then Fatima just kept him out of the way because he said, what are you going to do with this? And he said, no, 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 I don't mean any harm. I just want to read what's on there. I just want to understand what is on there. And then she said, well, you can only do so if you are pure, right? You drink and you, you know, you do other things. We don't know if you're pure. You don't know if we're state of purity. So Umar al he goes and he washes himself and then he comes back. And then he reads, Taha, ma anzalna alayka al-Qur'an li tashqa. We have not revealed the Qur'an to you, O Prophet, to cause you distress. Illa tadhkiratan liman yakhsha. But as a reminder to those in awe of Allah, It is a revelation from the one who created the earth and the high heavens. The most compassionate who is established on the throne. And then it talks a little bit about a conversation between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Musa alayhi salam. And then he reads up until the 14th verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Innani ana Allahu la ilaha illa ana fa'buduni wa aqimi salata li dhikri. I truly am Allah. There is no God worthy of worship except me. So worship me alone and establish prayer for my remembrance. Now what's beautiful about this verse specifically is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He refers to Himself three, uh, uh, three times in the single ayah. Right? Innani ana Allah. The ni is an attached pronoun. Ana is an independent pronoun, which means it has more powerful emphasis than an attached pronoun. And Allah is the name itself of the pronoun, which is more powerful than any independent pronoun. And so this shows that the, 
this, this is, the Mufassirun said, this shows the progression of Musa alayhi salam's iman. That when he first got revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he is a prophet and when he was in prophethood, he had a lot of confusion. He even had a lot of worries. You know, confronting Fir'aun, uh, the, the, the staff turning into a snake, all these different things. And so the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put him through a series of trials and tests that he will come across, uh, that he will come the other side victorious so that by the end of it, when the most important test comes, Musa alayhi salam will be confident. So when he takes the people of Bani Israel and splits the Red Sea and takes them through it, Musa alayhi salam no longer has any fear, no longer has any confusion. He is 100% confident in the victory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, innani ana Allahu la ilaha illa ana fa'budani wa aqimi salata li dhikri. Right? And so Umar radiallahu an, after reading the 14th verse of Surah at taha he begins to cry. It had a major impact on Umar radiallahu an. And so he says, take me to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now Fatima Radwana was still very wary of Omar. A few minutes ago, you just beat me and my husband. Well, like you, now you want me to take you to Prophet Sallam? Like, uh, what do you intend to do? And Omar Radwana said, Wallahi, I mean him no harm. I just want to accept Islam. And so once that was said, Khabab ibn al-Arat comes out of his hiding place, right? And at this point, he says, Congratulations, Ya Omar. Last night, I was sitting with the Prophet, and the Prophet made dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala aid the progression of Islam through the conversion of either Abu Jahl or Umar ibn Khattab, and it seems that the Prophet's du'a was accepted for you, Ya Umar. SubhanAllah. So now Umar, you know, sheathed his sword, right? And, but it's still, you know, concerning that he even had the weapon on him. And they all set out to reach Dar al arqab And Umar al he knocks on the door, and there's a quite few Sahaba inside at the time. You know, so they probably just finished a prayer, a halaqa, and one of the sahaba peeked through the door and saw that it was Umar Radhiwan standing outside, which was trouble enough. Right? And so the companions peek and they see him with a sword. And they're like, uh-oh. Now Hamza Radhiwan is in this gathering. And he is Asadullah, so he's a tough guy too. So during and this was three days, three days of him accepting Islam. And so in those three days, he did not leave the house of Arqab. And he just camped out there, morning and evening, doing ihtikaf with the Prophet for three days. Now by this time, Hamza is fully empowered in his iman. So he stands up. He says, oh Rasulullah, let him in. If Umar comes with khair, then we will receive him with khair. But if he comes with intentions of harm, let him come in. He's not the only one that's got a sword. And he even said, I will kill him with his own sword, <laughs> right? So Hamza was also very tough and brave too. And so Hamza said, open it. He can't bully us. The Prophet ﷺ was in front of him and he opened the door. Right? Again, I want you to think about this. The Prophet ﷺ was in front of Hamza when he opened the door while all the companions were worried about the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ being hurt by Umar ibn Khattab. The Prophet ﷺ was not someone to shy away from conflict. The Prophet Muhammad ﷺ was someone who was very welcoming. So when Umar ﷺ calmly walked through the door, Prophet ﷺ welcomed him, but at the same time, he was also a man of confidence. The best quality of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ is the way that he dealt with every individual according to their level. He understood different people and he dealt with them differently. Not one size fits all. There are some companions that accepted Islam because of the generosity of the Prophet. There are some companions that accepted Islam because of the compassion of the Prophet. There's also Rukan an, who accepted Islam purely because the Prophet ﷺ beat him in a wrestling match. Because Rukan was what? He was the best wrestler in Mecca. And he was, did not like Islam. So the Prophet ﷺ challenged him to a wrestling match and said, if I win, you accept Islam. And he won. Prophet ﷺ won. Didn't just win, he destroyed him. And this guy, Rukan, was undefeated. And so according to each person, he's going to give them da'wah to what their level is. And this is important for us as individuals, because we may have a certain temperament or we have made a certain style that appeals to us, but that doesn't mean it's going to appeal to other people. So you want to make sure that when you're speaking to people or when you want to 
uh, you know, highlight the greatness of Islam to people, you do so according to the way that they will respect it. Some people don't care about logic and philosophy and, uh, you know, uh, the, the kalam, cosmological argument. Some people don't care about that stuff. Some people just see that you fed them and that was very generous and now I like Muslims. I'm, it sounds funny, but I'm serious, right? Like that's, that's the, the compassion of the Prophet the generosity of the Prophet right? That he, he, he served people, he fed people. Sayyid al-Qawm he was, he was a, someone who wanted to always constantly serve everybody that was around him. And so may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us an example of our beloved Nabi Now there was other companions who knew why he was there. Ibn Mas'ud said that I heard the Prophet Muhammad making dua that he become Muslim and I knew the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam dua when they would be turned away, right? So the dua was, Allahumma izzil Islam bi ahabbi ahadhaini ar-rajulaini ilayka bi abi jahlin aw bi Umar ibn Khattab wa kana ahabbahuma ilayhi Umar That the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Oh Allah, strengthen Islam with one of the two men whom you love more. Abu Jahl or Umar ibn Khattab. And Ibn Umar said that the uh, most beloved of the two was Umar radiallahu So Umar radiallahu is now experiencing very powerful emotions. And the Prophet sallallahu understood the type of person Umar was. Umar was a fighter. He can get riled up very easily. So the Prophet stepped up to Umar and he got in Umar's face. He grabbed Umar radiallahu and said, What do you want Umar? What are you here for? And then Umar al-Khattab, he said, uh, he said, I'm here to accept Islam, right? I'm here to accept Islam. I come with no intention, no harm. I have come to accept Islam. And everything now changed, right? And the room erupts. And the narration says that the companions started shouting takbir. Allahu Akbar. And the Prophet ﷺ embraced this new young Muslim. This is one of the greatest, if not the greatest story of redemption in history. A man who is engaged in a lot of ills in society is going to become one of the greatest men this earth has ever seen. The second greatest companion of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? And he is going to change the course of history. The, 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 the spread of Islam during his lifetime was the largest spread. And so, you know, Omar then told the rest of the companions, who spreads news fast, right? Who spreads news fast? And they said, Fulan, right? They said, so-and-so, someone. And so, he went to that individual and says, don't you know that Omar is Muslim now? Go tell everyone about it, right? Go tweet it, right? Leak it. What, what is it? Woj bomb, right? So, Woj bomb alert. NBA joke. If you don't get it, it's all, all fine. So, Omar al-Khattab becomes Muslim. So, he even went to Abu Jahl himself, Umar radiallahu and says, I have become Muslim. And obviously, Abu Jahl became very, very angry. And he tells the people, I have become Muslim. And Abdullah ibn Umar, the son of the Prophet of, of Umar ibn Khattab, says he's about like eight years old at this time. He said, people became angry and tried to fight with Umar ibn Khattab because he was just shouting in the streets, I'm Muslim, I'm Muslim. And so, about dozens of people tried to come fight Umar ibn Khattab and he was single-handedly pushing away like 30 people. Like, like a scene in, from the Matrix. And so Umar al-Du'an, you know, he left the religion of their forefathers. So they tried to come and, and attack him. And then there was an old wise man that came and said, what are you guys doing? If you guys do this, Banu Adi, the tribe of Umar al-Khattab, will start a war. And Abdullah ibn Umar later, he asked who that man was and he said that man was As ibn Wa'il, the father of Amr ibn As. So now there is a new chapter, right? There is a new chapter in the life of the Muslims and the Sahaba had the confidence that they never had before. And so one day, Umar ibn Khattab told the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu we need a public demonstration. We have two guys to make a public impression. We have Umar ibn Khattab and Hamza radiallahu anh. We have both of them now, right? Or sorry, uh, Umar's narrating this, right? So we have me and Hamza radiallahu anh, have both of us now. And so Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam agreed and said, let's do it. So Hamza and Umar al-Khattab marched together from Dar al-Arqam into Bayt Allah. And Umar walked in first and he made his intentions now known. Everyone, I'm going to pray here right now. Then other Muslims lined up in between Umar and Hamza. And then the Prophet Muhammad was uh, placed in the front and led them all in prayer. 
And this was the last time the Muslims were able to congregate in prayer in public at the Haram. Right? Sorry, what did I say? No, this is the first time the Muslims were able to congregate in the Haram. There are incidences where individuals did it, but as a congregation, this is the first time. Right? And so from this lesson, we learn something interesting here. Right? So first of all, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud narrated that we are not able to pray near the Kaaba until Umar accepted Islam. And when he did, he literally fought off the Quraysh at the Kaaba. Then he prayed at the Kaaba and we were able to pray with him. But the lesson of this story, the moral of this story is sometimes it's good to be soft, sometimes it's good to be firm. And this is why the Prophet Muhammad was perfect. Right? Because he was able to figure out what required firmness and what required softness and when he needed to be firm and when he needed to be soft. And so the kuffar of Quraysh were very much annoyed by this. They were not able to carry out their aggression like they had planned. Being violent to the Muslims now means that you are also going up against Hamza and Omar radiallahu an. Final story and we will conclude. I promise it won't take more than five minutes inshaAllah. So the conversion of Omar was a victory of Islam. Right? And so he was also one of the few people who instead of slipping away during the night, during the migration to Medina, which we'll get to way down later on, he, would public, he publicly migrated. And he said, I'm leaving Mecca. If anyone has a problem with that, meet me outside. And if you meet me outside, your wife will be a widow and your mother will be uh, childless. Right? So, think about it. So his rulership over the Muslims during his Khilafah was also a mercy. Because so much grew under his Khilafah and so many Muslims that are Muslims here today, that are Muslims today, is because of the Khilafah of Omar radiallahu an. Now, uh, Umu Abdullah bint Abu Hafna, who was the mother of Abdullah ibn, A uh, ibn Amr ibn Rabi'ah, she was an early convert to Islam. She and her son were among those who migrated from Mecca to Habasha. So she mentions a story which tells us two things. Umar ibn Khattab, even during his so-called wild pre-Islamic days, had good in him. People's social perception of Umar was irrelevant. Only Allah and his perception of Umar ibn Khattab was, was important. So Umar Abdullah and her husband Amr were packing to go to Habasha. And her husband Amr had gone to take care of a few things. And so Umar saw Umm Abdullah uh, standing outside the home with bags. And he was not a Muslim then. He was still a trouble for Muslims. Right? He was still trouble for Muslims at this time. Umar asked, are you planning to go somewhere? And she replied, Wallahi, we are going to, get, uh, uh, to go out of uh, uh, the earth of God. Right? Mecca being, you know, the Baytullah, the earth of God. So, you have, you, because you guys have harmed us. You have oppressed us. So yes, I'm going to the land, I'm going uh, to leave the land of Allah. And we will stay there until Allah will make a way for us back. And so Umar then looked at Umar Abdullah and said, May God be with you. Right? And he didn't say anything else. And Umar Abdullah narrated that I saw some softness in Umar that I had never seen before. And he turned around and walked away. He seemed sad. He seemed contemplative. That he made lives so terrible for Muslims that they were running away from their own homes. And so her husband Amr came, comes back and Umar Abdullah told him the whole story. And Umar Abdullah said, You missed it. And Amr asked Umar Abdullah, well, are you hopeful that Umar will accept Islam? And she said, yes, I actually am. I saw his face, I saw something touch his heart. Right? And uh, he makes a funny comment. Um, and he says, I know Umar, right? and I know he's not going to accept Islam. The donkey of Khattab, meaning the Umar, Umar ibn Khattab's donkey, will accept Islam before the son of Khattab accepts Islam. Right? So, um, you know, uh, it's a funny comment, but it also teaches us what? No one is ever out of the reach of hope. No one is ever out of the reach of salvation. No one is ever out of the reach of redemption. And Umar ibn Khattab is the greatest example of that redemption, of that salvation, of that hope. And in our deen, we always only have optimism. We are not pessimistic people. We are optimistic people. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will always make a way for those who are optimistic. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Give us the ability to make amal upon what we learned. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasna wa fi akhirati hasna wa qina adhan bin nar. Subhanahu rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. Wa salamu ala mursaleen. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Inshallah, I will uh, take a couple questions. Three max.
inshallah. Anything from the sister side first? Questions? No? Uh, brothers, any questions? Yes, Habib. Um, and a lot of the like sayings you had in Arabic, like Abu Jahl said, Wallahi, and Sayyidina Hamza said, Wallahi, or yeah. Yeah, Allah, or like, so I know they worship idols, but they ha did they have a concept of Allah, or was it the same? Or did they use the same word, or what was like? Yeah, so, um, so because these, these are the descendants of Ibrahim, alayhi salam. Right? These are descendants of Ismail alayhi salam. So they do have a concept of Allah. They believed in Allah. They even believed in Allah as like the main God. Right? But they associated partners with him and they made idols and saying that uh, uh, we have to go through idols to, to reach God. Right? They basically found themselves as unworthy to reach God. And so in order to reach God, we have to worship uh, the friends of God instead. Right? Um, and so that, that's what the issue was. Right? But they did have a concept of Allah. Yes, they did. Yes, they would use the same word. Allah and Wallahi and things like that, right? Yeah. Okay, there was a question online. Sorry. Let me look at it real quick. Uh, somebody's asking, my question is, what does Allah mean when he says we or us? And why does Allah have masculinity? Jazakum Allahu khayran. It's just an Arabic grammar thing. Honestly, like it has nothing to do with uh, anything that deep. The we or us is the royal we, right? Like when a king stands up and says, we did this, we did this, right? When in reality, like he's the one who actually like, you know, uh, uh, made all the rules or made all the commands, right? So it's, it's, it's a royal we, right? And it's uh, in, in the Arabic language, it emphasizes power, it emphasizes might. But it's never understood to mean multiple. Right, mean multiple at all. So this is, uh, and then when he's, when uh, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is referred to in the masculine sense, this is also just you know um, anything that you know, uh, or this is Allah Subhanahu wa Taala uh, when when it comes to neutral, having no gender, it is referred to in the masculine sense most of the time because you know that's just the way Arabic grammar works, and you just all have to deal with it and accept it. Right, it has nothing to do with uh, masculinity and femininity, one being better than the other. Uh, it, it's one of the problems we have with translation. Uh, when people translate things, they uh, the, 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 and things come across a certain way that they're not supposed to. But this is how it's always been understood by the Arabs. This has always been understood by the people of uh, of the Quran. Um, Wallahu ta'ala alam. Okay, tamam. If anybody has any questions, uh, brothers, sisters, I'll be here, inshallah, uh, uh, for a while, so that you guys can come up and ask any questions you want, inshallah ta'ala. جزاكم الله خيرا سبحان الله سبحان الله وبحمدك نشهد ان لا اله الا انت نستغفرك الله ونتوب اليك السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته